It's great to be here with you. I'd like to begin with a thought that is found in the text of the Earth Charter that Pope Francis cites in Laudato Si. We stand at a critical moment in Earth's history, a time when humanity must choose its future. As the world becomes increasingly interdependent and fragile, the future at once holds great peril and also great promise. To move forward, we must recognize that in the midst of a magnificent diversity of cultures and life forms, we are one human family and one earth community with a common destiny. We must join together to bring forth a sustainable global society founded upon respect for nature, universal human rights, economic justice, a culture of peace. Towards this end, it is imperative that we, the peoples of earth, declare our responsibility to one another, to the greater community of life, of all living things and the earth, and to future generations. It's a great pleasure for me to be here. I want to thank uh, Brother Garrett, Brother Keith Warner, and others who contacted me several months ago, actually a number of months ago, to ask if I'd be willing to share a few thoughts with you tonight. I think what I'd like to really talk about is more of a personal journey. A journey that I found myself embarking upon, not because I wanted to or I planned to, but a journey that um, really I, I blame salmon. I blame a river called the Yukon in central Alaska. I blame the indigenous Alaskan peoples who suffered disproportionate of consequences from COVID. I blame sinking ground, literally and figuratively, melting permafrost. All of these brought me to a point in my life where I had to make, I had to come to a decision, if you will. I had to decide what the fourth second was going to look like in my life. And so that's the story I'd like to share with you tonight. It continues now through my engagement at the Siena College um, Center, Laudato Si Center for Integral Ecology that we begun less than a year ago in uh, near Albany, New York, and continues its journey, at times difficult, in order to reshape an institutional and individual way of thinking about our lives on this planet, together with all living creatures, the few for future generations for all. In the description I received regarding what I might present to you this evening, I was asked to offer perspectives on the Pope's encyclical Laudato Si, to highlight the specifically Franciscan dimensions present in this amazing and challenging call to action. But being somewhat less a well-disciplined Franciscan, I do not plan to present the deep biblical, theological, specifically Franciscan elements contained in the encyclical, at least not directly. I think you've already touched on these important aspects in other Zoom sessions. If not, perhaps we can arrange another moment to discuss these matters, uh, perhaps something between FST and the center. We can arrange another moment for further discussion. My approach is much more practical. I'd like to provide you with a personal narrative describing an interior journey that I was lured, tricked, deceived, or pulled into by nature, by a specific group of people, and by God. When I reflect on this experience of being duped or deceived, these are two words used in the biblical text translated differently, I cannot help but call to mind words from the prophet Jeremiah, O Lord, you have deceived me, and I allowed myself to be deceived. You have overcome me and prevailed. There's been a second movement, totally unplanned at the beginning, one that has created opportunities for me personally at Siena College, for a number of Franciscan colleges and universities in the United States that are part of the Association of Franciscan Colleges and Universities, and increasingly a small number of other Franciscan institutions of higher education outside of the United States, an effort to unite our efforts in an effective and strategic partnership. In reality, we're in the process of building a Franciscan Laudato Si network, both national and global. I hope to share a few of the details in what follows. For those well-versed in things Franciscana, we know that Francis did not create a well-defined way of life with structures and theories to justify and back up the way of life he proposed to his followers, something he received as gift from God, something perhaps 
in other traditions and other uh, experiences of religious life at his time, which sought to follow a Benedictine model of the great monastic traditions, Benedictine Cistercians. Francis, we know, was too free of a spirit to take this approach. His, was involved, his way involved a process of doing, of discovery, that went from direct experience, the doing of penance, of service, living together, engaging with those most in need, to the creation of structures and a code of conduct, a rule in life that remained open to ongoing divine inspiration, while at the same time remained sensitive to the needs and limitations of the brothers in the fraternity. Francis' approach to religious life was grounded in the doing of the gospel. This was made clear in his last testament, revealing an approach to his gospel-inspired way of life to a permanent process of dialogue, synodality, of deep listening. Francis sought to listen to God's voice, the voice rising from human experience, particularly the voice of the suffering, the excluded, the poor, the wounded, the voice rising from the natural order, creation, the voice of his brothers, the voice of the poor clares and the members of the order of penitents. He recognized that his was a shared journey, not only embracing those within the church, those who were part of the Franciscan mo movement, but also those who were excluded because of social position, the poor, the lepers, public sinners, thieves, others, or by religious affiliation, the Muslim enemies, the Saracens, heretics, other non-believers, apostates, or those excluded for any other reason. His journey was one that expanded to embrace all celestial beings, all living and non-living things, all as brothers and sisters, members of the one family of God, creator, savior, sustainer. Praise be you, my Lord, with all of your creatures, especially Sir Brother Sun, Sister Moon, and the stars, Brother Wind, Sister Water, Brother Fire, Sister Mother Earth, as witnessed in his Magna Carta on the interconnectedness of all of life, the Canticle of Creatures. It is my personal conviction that Francis, the one whom I have discovered over the course of a number of years, my Francis, each one of us have our, our own Francis's, by the way, um, progressively lived and practiced his way towards an ecological conversion. I say this not to be anachronistic or to force an, an interpretation of Francis's life that has little or nothing to do with his experience of gospel living he shared with the church, his followers, and the world. Strangely, in Laudato Si, Pope Francis comes to this same conclusion. He writes, I believe that St. Francis is the excellent example par excellence of care for the vulnerable and of an integral ecology lived out joyfully and authentically. He shows us how inseparable the bond between concern for nature, justice for the poor, commitment to society, and inner peace. Francis shares with us, St. Francis shares with us the fruits of this interior ecological conversion experience in his hymn of praise to God for faith-filled witness, the faith-filled witness of all creatures expressed in the canticle of creatures. This hymn of praise serves as an invitation to human beings to recognize their creatureliness and to join with all other creatures in accepting their absolute dependence on God and interdependence and interconnectedness with everyone, with everything in the pluriverses, the cosmoi. The canticle provides us with the contours and content of the type of ecological conversion capable of reordering our disordered relationships with one another and with the natural environment, leading to a process of the healing of the earth community. Let's leave the story of Francis for a moment. I want to invite you to journey with me from the General Curia in Rome to the Yukon, to life among the Athabascan people, to salmon fish, and to permafrost, from Alaska to Siena College, where I currently serve as the director of the new Baptiste Center for Integral Ecology, Oh, and by the way, if this does not sound like a very con contorted journey, I'm all ears. You've got a better story to tell. For 12 years, 
I served as domestic worker, also called leadership at the general headquarters of the Order of Friars Minor, Franciscans. On certain occasions, I actually was physically present and joined our other brothers in fraternity to do even domestic house cleaning. For anyone who has worked in leadership in the public, private, or nonprofit or religious context, you know it brings many blessings, but also thrusts you into thorny situations from which you can, cannot escape unscathed. During my last nearly 15 months of service, I, like billions of others in Italy and throughout the world, was confined to house quarters due to the global SARS COVID-19 pandemic. During this period, I had the opportunity to slow down, begin once again to have the luxuries to step back, to read, to gain some perspective, to explore my inner world, but also the natural world around me. I don't know how it was in the United States or elsewhere since none of us could travel, but the only outdoor activity permitted for more than a year in Rome was solitary exercise. So I was able to expand my love of biking, spend several, spending several hours each day riding a path along open fields and forests running parallel to the Tiber River on the outskirts of Rome. I relearned how to be in and with nature and began to sense nature not only outside of me, surrounding me like an envelope does with a letter. I began to sense that nature was inside of me and I inside of it. It was during this period that I began to discover write, uh, certain writings by Erlich Kage, a Norwegian lawyer, naturalist, explorer, father of three daughters, and author of a book entitled Silence in an Age of Noise. For some strange reason, this book caught me by surprise and nurtured within me a desire to step back, go into the natural environment, spend time listening to the deafening silence of nature's voices, the sound of sun rays and moonlight, of crickets, of leaves rustled by the wind, of waters flowing through a watercourse, of the breeze gently caressing and whispering its music. After my term of service, I received permission to take a period of sabbatical to listen and undergo renewal, and I would even say purification. Jokingly, I tell people I, I went away, I took time off so I could be, my, be detoxed from the experience of Rome. Rome really wasn't that bad, but it had its moments. After 12 years in Rome, working under constant pressure to produce inspirational texts, moving liturgical performances, reaching into the pain lives of members of the order and the larger human community, visiting regions of extreme poverty, violence, those forgotten and discarded, seeing, watching destruction of the natural environment in different places of the world where friars are working alongside people suffering the consequences of these experience, these traumatic experiences, and also celebrating great and small achievements. I found it was time to step back, take time to listen, to allow God to work inside of me. One of the places I believed this could, perhaps I could undertake this, this time of space and silence, was in our Franciscan mission presence among the Athabascan tribal people living in the central part of Alaska, on the Yukon River. After a brief holiday with family and friends, I packed every warm piece of clothing I could find or borrow and headed to Alaska. I spent an extended period of time in the river village of Galena, located 270 air miles west of Fairbanks, 350 miles north of Anchorage. Most of its 500 inhabitants are members of the Athabascan or the Dena tribe. Their livelihood depends on three sources, fishing and hunting, local employment for the Bureau of Tribal Affairs or construction or small businesses. And the third means money received from the Alaskan Permanent Fund, a dividend from oil revenues given to all Alaskan residents. The culture and way of the Athabascan peoples is organized according to seasons and access to natural resources. The natural environment also plays a prominent role in the rituals they have created to provide solace in times of crisis and death. 
to ensure the transmission of their history and cultural values to succeeding generations, to reinforce networks of social and nat natural relationships of solidarity. These ritual practices re remind the Athabascan people of their connectedness to one another and to the natural environment. They believe and act as members who are part of nature, not separate from or outside of it. Nature dwells in them and they within it. Pope Francis has on numerous occasions underscored the deep integral relationship between native and indigenous peoples with the environment and suggests their experience could inform our efforts to gain deeper awareness of the interconnectedness of all of life, the beginning of the process of an ecological conversion. <clears throat> During my brief stay, <clears throat> three significant events grabbed my undivided attention. A crisis with salmon, a thawing of permafrost, and the tremendous human suffering and deaths provoked by the COVID-19 pandemic. One might ask what salmon, permafrost, and COVID have in common. What are they to do with Laudato Si? Why do these three events command my attention? I hope to provide some answers in what follows. The ancestors of the Athabascan, Athabascan Native peoples arrived in Alaska, crossing over the Bering Straits some 35,000 years ago. Due to extreme weather conditions, their dietary needs demanded two things high protein, and fat or rich oils. Guess what? Salmon, red, particularly king salmon, provides both of these. Beyond dietary considerations, fishing, cleaning, and conservation of salmon provide occasions for the people to talk about the challenges and joys of daily life, transmit oral histories of their people to younger generations, and to remind themselves of their connectedness and dependence on nature and their mutual interdependence on one another. When these cultural patterns were disturbed by a precipitous decline of salmon, other consequences followed. The list is too long to describe a complete description of the factors that contributed to the decline of salmon in Alaska, but five stand out. Rising sea temperatures in the Northern Pacific and in the rivers, resulting in a decrease, decrease of food for salmon, photoplankton, and other prey, commercial overfishing, pollutants and runoffs from agricultural pesticides and other chemicals, leading to an increase of diseases and parasites, fourth, the destruction of habitats and forcing a change in migration patterns of salmon, and the fifth, increased disease and parasites. In a recent study, it's been suggested that there will be a 90% decline in global wild salmon production by 2040. Water temperatures off the coast of Alaska have risen 4.5 degrees in recent years. Other fish, mammals, and wildlife may have similarly, they have been similarly affected. It's clear to marine biologists and other experts that human-induced climate change and global warming contribute significantly to warmer waters in, in the Pacific Northwest, leading to a decline in salmon populations in Alaska. Strangely, there's one exception, Bristol Bay, where sockeye and pink salmon are approaching record levels due to what some describe as a temporary adaptation to rising water temperatures. But there's serious concern regarding how long this will last as the water temperatures continue to rise. Salmon play an important role in the food chain and ecosystems of the region. They are a major source of food for many species, including bears, eagles, other fish, human beings. A declining salmon population has a domino effect on the entire food chain. There's been an increase in populations of invasive fish species preying on smaller fish, having a ripple effect throughout the ecosystem. Salmon that return to spawn fertilize the rivers, streams, and surrounding ecosystems, in general leading and historically to increased productivity and biodiversity. Salmon also play a major role in providing high-protein and oil-rich diet to bears. You can imagine, you've probably read stories, as salmon declines, bears are pushed and pulled to search 
for alternative food sources, leading them to increasingly confrontations with human communities. Salmon decreases lead to a loss of employment at the local, regional, national, and international levels. Communities are adversely affected as net loss of income results in less money to local communities. Supply chains are affected, leading to further negative economic consequences. Salmon and other fishing activities in Alaska are valued at about $5.7 billion annually and provide over 60,000 jobs. Salmon are our friends, providing us everything while demanding very little. Scholars tell us that what takes, locally, takes place locally can have a global impact and vice versa. So the Yukon salmon crisis is what, one example of what's happening throughout ecosystems across the entire globe. The disconnect between respect for nature, the impact of the human footprint on ecosystems, on life, life species, having an impact on also the way that we are fed, nourished, the future of our own lives. So we once said that you might seem like it's out there away, distant. What has Alaska got to do with our lives? Someone once wrote, it could come soon to your garden or favorite orchard, to the place where you live and diminish the capacity to nourish both in calories and in culture, your life ways. One day in my early stay, I was driving with another Franciscan and noticed the car undulating. I don't know if you know what that's kind of undulating, kind of up and down. The road looked more like tracks full of roller coaster than a normal road. I also noticed sections of buildings and houses that appeared to be sagging. I learned that these were direct results of the melting of permafrost. Ice cream is not the only substance that melts. Permafrost is critical for the stability of local infrastructures, homes, buildings, roads, schools, hospitals, churches, social centers. Permafrost also contains large amounts of organic matter frozen for tens of thousands of years, serving as a huge protective reservoir of methane, carbon dioxide, and other gases. When permafrost thaws, bacteria begins to break down the organic material. Carbon in the form of carbon dioxide, methane, greenhouse gases are released into the atmosphere. This creates what scientists call a positive feedback loop, resulting in an increase in the warming of the planet. Warming provokes further melting of permafrost, and the cycle repeats itself. Little did I realize how extensive permafrost is on the planet. It accounts for almost 11% of the total surface of the planet. When permafrost melts, entire ecosystems are deeply affected, leading to changes in vegetation, waterways, a reduction in biodiversity and wildlife populations, and has a direct impact on the quality of human life as well. Before I move to a third event that had a profound impact on my time in Alaska, I want to underscore once again the significance of an understanding of the interconnectedness of all of life, social and environment, environmental, the circle of life that native and indigenous populations and rural communities have never lost. This is made clear. It is a sub-theme that runs throughout the writing of Pope Francis, recent writings, in particular is present in Laudato Si, this understanding of the interconnectedness of all things, the one <laughs> has an impact upon the other. Pangolins in your parlors, I'd like to turn attention for a moment to the third catastrophe that I experienced in my brief time in Galeno, Alaska, it was the SARS COVID-19 pandemic. I thought I had escaped it when I left Rome and Europe. I discovered that native tribal populations in the U.S. were 3.5 times more likely to be infected with the virus than normal, than, than what we call descendants of Europeans. Hospitalizations and death rates reflected these same rates due to lack of access to quality health care, poverty, underlying health conditions, and cultural conceptions related to illness and disease. 
Tribal nations in the U.S. were forced to shutter businesses and tourism industry, leading to unemployment and financial strain. Social distancing measures and lockdowns disrupted cultural practices and traditions, the potlatch, sweat lodges, and just normal social interactions, and provoked increased social isolation, depression, and increase in substance abuse and suicide. With Without invitation or volition, Galena and the Athabascan people had welcomed non-native pangolins into their parlors. As temperatures continue to rise on the planet, as native natural habitats serving as barriers are destroyed, the risk of disease-carrying vectors and transmissions of zoonotic disease for human beings and for animals will only increase. Following my return from Alaska to Chicago, where I was temporarily living, I was contacted by the president of Siena College to see if I would be interested in joining the Siena College community and the Franciscan fraternity. He invited me to visit the school, an invitation I accepted. So in January 2022, I flew to Albany, had a chance to get to the school, met with the president and the friar who is vice president for mission, Brother Mark Reamer. The position that I was offered was given this flashy title, Distinguished Scholar in Residence. And I asked, well, what do you mean? What the heck is that? I, you know, tell me what it is. No one could give me any answer. They told me, well, you could do a little bit of this, a little bit of that. If you felt like writing, you could. If you want to come in and give a course occasionally, uh, maybe a lecture here or there. But you'd have plenty of time on your own. And I thought, uh, frankly, I said, what a boring existence. I, I, I don't want, I didn't want neither the title nor the description. So I told him I'm gonna have to think about it a little bit. So give me a little time and I'll get back to you. Uh, and I did, I took a little time. I took about six months. I was also, while I was there, I was also asked to deliver the commencement address in the spring of 2022. I also told them I'd get back to them. I wanted to take a little time to think it through. And in the meantime, I did some digging. I discovered two things. First, the previous year, Condoleezza Rice, the former US Secretary of State had given the address, I thought, Oh, who's going to follow Condoleezza Rice? Who am I? And second, I discovered that Dr. Paul Farmer, Harvard graduate and professor of medicine, medical anthropology, known for his tireless work among the poor and excluded in Haiti and elsewhere, was actually invited to be and accepted to be the commencement speaker. But unfortunately, he met with an untimely death. So, okay, I was... Second, second in line, that's okay. I'm just I'm, I'm kind of being humorous here. I did agree to do the address. But even when I came in May for the address, I told them I was not yet prepared uh, to commit to the school because I was not yet sure the school was prepared to commit to something much deeper, much more demanding than perhaps what I thought where they they would they, where their comfort zone would be. Several months later, I proposed I made a proposal to create a Laudato C Center for Integral Ecology on the campus of Siena, a center that would serve not only Siena, but the other Franciscan schools in the United States. The dream that, was, that I had in mind was that we might connect Franciscan institutions of higher learning together across the United States, create a network, a Laudato C Franciscan network that we would be able to use to strengthen, mutually strengthen one another, to fill in the gaps that we had and actually to spur each other on to a deeper commitment to the values contained in the encyclical Laudato Si. Interesting, the proposal was run by the board of trustees, the president of the board and the president of the college, and they accepted. I still not sure that they really knew what they were getting in for. I don't think I did either or none of us do. It was still a part of me that wanted to return to Africa during all this time. I spent many years, as you heard, uh, particularly working in peace building and reconciliation. But somehow the salmon, the permafrost, and the pangolins would not let me go. Since January 23, I have been working with the fac uh, faculty, and students, administration, friars, facility staff within, within Siena, with the Board of Trustees now, and with other with the uh, with the alumni to try to develop a, a clearer vision of what an ecological college might look like, and particularly an ecological Franciscan college. 
We tried to create synergy, expand, deepen the commitment of the school to fundamental principles outlined in Laudato Si. So it's been a learning curve and a learning process, not only for, it's been for me as well, but it's been a learning curve and a learning process for many others here at Siena. The mission office to whom I report and the entire mission team welcomed a proposal to organize a week of events for the celebration of St. Francis on October 23, but to organize it along the lines of Laudato Si, the first time that this had been attempted. The students led most of these events, including an interesting theatrical product production entitled An Enemy of the People by Hendrik Ibsen, late 19th century Norwegian playwright dealing with issues related to human impact on the environment. I, again, I had kind of laughed. I thought this is God's humor because one of the books that led me to desire to go to Alaska was written by a Norwegian writer. And here we are at the coming to the uh, St. Francis Week 2023, um, guided by a play produced by students uh, by a Norwegian playwright. In June 2023, Garrett, you were present. I was able, I invited to address uh, participants attending a biannual symposium organized by the Association of Franciscan Colleges and Universities. At that conference and after discussion with several other people, um, we came to a consensus that this would be a proper and perfect opportunity not just to talk about what was in Laudato Si, not talk about the values and how important they are to our Franciscan tradition, but to begin to plan some steps for positive concrete action that would move us forward in, in a way that, was, that would be transformational. And so at that conference, I proposed to the Franciscan institu institutions of higher learning that we begin a process toward becoming ecological universities colleges. This involved a commitment to the principles of sustainability and integral ecology to allow these to begin to redefine the nature of Franciscan higher education and the role and the mission of the school to the world. To accomplish this, I pro proposed the creation of a working group with the Association of Franciscan Colleges and Universities to share lessons learned, encourage and strengthen efforts toward an integral ecology, create opportunities for the group to work on specific areas of common interest and I'm pleased to report to those listening tonight that since August 2023 to the present, five of our institutions are meeting monthly and preparing programs and specific action steps that I believe will enable us to carry forth and deepen understanding and knowledge of what is in the encyclical, but beyond the encyclical, to deepen our Franciscan understanding and commitment to carry forth a vision, an integral ecological vision that holds hope for pre preparing future leaders for the world, the students, and through the professors and the many contacts that they have, and even beyond that, not just the campus community, but the larger communities of our campus, the alumni, and through the alumni, the larger community, and then beyond that to the cities and to hopefully the country and to the world. It's a grandiose project, but I believe all of us, I think, here are now have bought into it, and I think we're moving together with other Franciscan colleges and universities. The story doesn't stop only with the U.S. Franciscan Adopto C network. We've begun to work with not quite five, we've four of five that we've identified Franciscan centers of higher learning outside of the United States. One of them is in Ho Chi Minh City, Vietnam. Another is in Colwesi in a mining town, mining precious metals used for the green e e economy in the Democratic Republic of Congo. A third is in Colombia, a fourth in Italy at the Antonianum, where someone on this uh, on this uh, this evening's um, Zoom conference uh, was a teacher, and Brazil. Our hope is that we might receive sufficient funding from a variety of sources is to enable our Franciscan networks, U.S. and global, to exercise a deeper and broader impact on the communities in which they are located. We're also promoting collaboration with Franciscan organizations. We're working closely with Franciscan Action Network, Franciscans International, with other Catholic movements and organizations, the Laudato, Laudato Si movement, Catholic Climate Covenant, Catholic Relief Services, and non-Catholic groups and initiatives 
mostly of these local or regional, but also at the national and international levels. As part of our next steps, we're sponsoring in collaboration with Siena College Academic Center for, Center for Sustainability, the Sustainability Steering Committee, the Mission Office, and representatives from the three schools. We're going to sponsor a major symposium on sustainability, integral ecology, October 10th to 11th, 2024. As you see, those are the people we're inviting to the table to join us. Next week, we will invite uh, the UN Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, to serve as the principal speaker, the keynote speaker. We're hoping say a prayer that we he will respond. In April, we're hoping to meet with Pope Francis in Rome and to propose to him during a meeting uh, with the Board of Trustees and members of the trustees, if it's accepted, uh, to propose to him that he would prepare a short video message for our Franciscan colleges and universities, for our young students, but also administrators, professors, and others to commit to deepening their commitment, they're deepening their awareness of and engagement with the values of integral ecology. And we're, we're going to be trying to contact Greta Thunberg as well to see if she would be willing to speak through the students to all of us, her powerful message of challenging all of us to wake up and to engage completely with all of our energies in, in, in trying to turn, reverse the current course for the sake of future generations. This, you'll receive more information about this two-day symposium, October 10th, 11th, 2024. Um, and we're already beginning initial stages for the, what we call the follow-up annual um, symposium that we hope to convene in October, 2025, with a focus on the 800th anniversary of the Canticle of Creatures and the 10th anniversary of the Laudato Si. In closing, I'd like to call your attention to the description of our just something very brief about the description of the work of the center. We decided we de uh, describe ourselves as follows. The Laudato Si Center is a vehicle for promoting Pope Francis's vision of integral ecology laid out in his encyclical into all aspects of college university life. The initiative seeks collaboration with ongoing efforts for sustainability within the college, as well as Franciscan institutions in the US and abroad civic governmental institutions at various levels, practitioners of other faiths, and all people of goodwill to work together for the common good. We put environmental justice at the forefront of our efforts, seeking participation by those who are suffering the greatest from the consequences of climate change, Africa, Asia, Latin America, parts of the United States and Europe, so that their voices might help transform the minds and hearts of all within each of our respective communities. I share one closing comment. I'm, I'm running out of time here. I'm going to be respectful for time for question and answers. One closing reflection for Pope Francis in his encyclical Fratelli Tutti. He says this, here we have a splendid secret that shows us how to dream and to turn our life into a wonderful adventure. No one can face life in isolation. We need a community that supports and helps us in which we can help one another and keep looking ahead how important it is to dream together. By ourselves, we risk seeing mirages, things that are not there. Dreams, on the other hand, are built together. Let us dream then as a single human family, and I would say as a single Franciscan family, members and, and friends, as fellow travelers sharing the same flesh, as children of the same earth, which is our common home, each of us bringing the richness, richness of his or her beliefs and convictions, each of us with his or her own voice, brothers and sisters all. I leave you with only one question. What will you, what will we do with the fourth second? In the words of St. Francis, let us begin. Thank you for your attention, and I'm open to questions.